Hello, it's Scott Manley here. It's been three months since China's Zurong rover landed on Mars and began the process of slowly returning images and other scientific data from the surface of Mars. Now, depending upon how you measure it, China is the second country to successfully land on Mars, but some might argue it's third or the fourth. The other qualifiers are the Soviet Union, which landed Mars 3 before the United States did, but um, unfortunately, Mars 3 never returned any data and broke down seconds after landing. And Britain actually landed Beagle 2. However, they lost contact with it immediately. And it was only years later that photographs from Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter showed that it had, in fact, began unfurling its solar panels, but had been unable to complete this in contact. So those are the other two candidates for soft landing. But let's be clear, this is vastly more successful. And I think they totally deserve the second place trophy here. Now, immediately after landing, there weren't any photos available and it took them several days because the spacecraft or the rover on the surface had a direct uplink that had a bit rate of like 16 bits per second and they weren't about to start uploading megabytes of images over that. They had to wait for the Tianwen spacecraft in orbit to shift into a, an orbit which would pass over the landing site uh, like once every day. After a few days, we did get to see a few images. This is obviously from the top of the rover, showing the solar panels unfurled, the low gain antenna there, and that circular feature there, that's a thermal ballast. It's like a, it contains a hydrocarbon in there, which has a freezing point roughly around the temperature of Mars. So it warms up during the day and cools down at night, but it tends to stay around that freezing point. And then there was this monochrome image supplied by one of the hazard avoidance cameras on the rover itself, looking down the ramp onto the surface of Mars. And it, they took about a week to descend onto the surface. And it wasn't just them, you know, waiting for the data to come back. They got the data, they modeled the surface, and then they actually built a simulated version in the lab just to make sure that in the, the orientation that it would go down the rails just fine. Apparently, the suspension system used by Zurong has some extra active components and they can raise the front and the rear of the rover independently if necessary. But yeah, this is a really cool little animation showing the descent onto the surface. And of course, we get to see the lander that it came down on. And I think it's worth noting that we haven't had a lander that's del been delivered to the surface of Mars like this, as in a rocket powered platform with a ramp. If you look at Curiosity and Perseverance, they use the Sky Crane and uh, Opportunity and Spirit had this big sort of bouncy ball thing. This is a single rocket engine landing on the surface of Mars. And well, we'll talk a little more about that later. Now, around the same time, Tianwen-1 was able to return this image of the landing site. Now, Tianwen-1 is very much a science satellite in its own right, and as it's working as a relay, because it's had to set its orbit to synchronize with the rover, it's sort of limiting its science gathering capabilities. But anyway, on the left, this is before, on the right, this is after, and you see three locations marked on Mars. At the top, you have the lander showing a, an interesting burn pattern around it. There's two objects there because one is the lander, the other is the rover. Below that, they have the aero shell and the parachute marked. And to the southwest of that, that is where the heat shield landed. Of course, NASA has its own imaging capabilities. It has the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter with the high-rise camera, and that's able to get resolutions down to like half a meter or less. In this image, you can very clearly see the lander and the rover as two separate entities. And depending upon how you adjust, you process this, there's evidence of the ramps being visible on the right side of this image facing mostly east. And yes, the burn scar is a very interesting shape, and I had a lot of questions about this. It shows us a generally dark area with two light areas uh, heading to the north and the south. And this is sort of very similar in some ways to what we saw for Perseverance's landing, but that was via a sky crane. And its shape was due to having rockets that were firing over the top of the rover to the left and the right, and those formed two distinct burn marks. And then along the middle, there was this stagnation zone where the air or the gases didn't flow quite as fast. But Zurong's lander only had a single engine, and from this image, there was nothing getting in the way of the flow. There were the four legs, but if the four legs were responsible for causing these two bright lobes, how did that work? Why didn't you see a cross-shaped pattern? 
So I think what this is, is a post landing event. After they land, they've got high pressure propellant tanks and they just want to vent them. And the vents just happen to be located out of the sides. These are the sides that are 90 degrees away from the uh, landing ramp. So that they're not going to get in the way of that. I think you know that's what's going on here. Also, if you look at this image of the lander, this is sort of lined up with the roll reaction control thrusters. So those are sitting along the edge. And if you imagine when this is going down, there is an aero shell over the top of that and a heat shield underneath. And that's where the jets poke out through the aero shell so that they can control the descent. So it's conceivable that they just depressurize the system by firing those engines as well. And those are pointed at 90 degrees to that ramp and exactly along the line of those burn scars. Also, this image gives us an amazing view of the crater which was made underneath the lander due to the rocket exhaust from that main engine softly touching down on Mars. Now, this is a much deeper crater than we've seen on other planetary landers, but really it's the first time we've seen underneath a Mars lander which has landed on a rocket. For comparison, the Chang'e missions to the moon, they didn't leave a crater that was nearly so obvious. And that's because they shut their engine down about you know 15 feet above the surface and then fell to the surface. They didn't do that on Mars. They powered all the way to the surface. But also there's a strong effect whereby a rocket in a vacuum expands out very quickly, whereas a rocket in an atmosphere, even an atmosphere as thin as that of Mars, will be collimated and form into a jet that bores into the surface much more efficiently than it would on the moon. This is one of the things that leads to the sky crane, which when you think about it sounds a bit ridiculous, but when actually you look at the science, it's the best way to do it. There's another little engineering feature here. There's a little cylindrical object that sort of hangs out from underneath the lip there. That is like the black box that was there in case of an accident. They had a team build this and, you know, you can get an idea how big it is by this photo of the guy working on it on the train. They shot this out of a cannon to make sure it could survive any reasonable impact. And that was there. If there was a crash, it would be able to transmit some parts of the telemetry so that uh, they could perhaps have a better chance the next time. But yeah, they didn't need it. After a while, they did also start sharing engineering camera views. Um, this is, of course, the parachute deployment, which NASA didn't really capture camera views of the parachute deployment until Perseverance. And yeah, I can see why these days there's your cameras are so much cheaper, so it makes sense to capture this data and share it for improvements to future uh, flights. This is the aero shell getting popped off. You can see the parachute pulling it away. And of course, once this goes away, the vehicle starts to go into powered descent mode, uses its rocket propulsion. It has many sensors, it has cameras, radar, uh, other Im onboard image processing looking for a landing site. They chose the plane of Utopia Planitia because it was pretty well known to be a pretty, you know, an area with a lot of flat spaces, therefore relatively easy to land on. It's believed that Utopia Planitia used to be a sea at some point in the past. There's signs of an ancient shoreline at higher elevations, so this was probably underwater in the past. And this image here actually gives you a really good idea of the sort of quality of the surface here. This is also one of the sort of great uh, images from the mission as far as I'm concerned. NASA hasn't done anything like this. They had to carry an extra camera and then set it down on the surface of the planet so that it could take a photo of the rover and the lander together. And you know, this is great PR. This is a country that's absolutely understanding the prestige that it can gain through uh, communication of its spaceflight capabilities. And if you thought that dropping a camera on the surface of Mars to take a photo of your rover was cool, well, they dropped a camera off in deep space so it could take a photograph of the spacecraft in flight. Japan's Hayabusa 2 mission made extensive use of deployable cameras to get scientific imagery, but these amazing images are entirely there for their PR value. After the initial reconnaissance and photo opportunities, Zurong headed off south, and I think its main target was this black object in the distance, which is the aero shell and the parachute attached to it. Again, this is an mission which is doing science, but part of that science is figuring out how best to land on Mars and inspecting your hardware can provide all sorts of extra information on that front. And this stands in stark contrast to the more mature NASA program where the engineering data which might get gained from analyzing the parachute is 
outweighed by the fact that there's a small risk that the rover could get tangled in the parachute and lose the scientific value that the rover wants to bring from its, uh, its analysis. But as of right now, Zurong has continued moving and has just completed one kilometre. It's been moving about 10 metres per day. Now, the downsides of picking an easy place to land is that there's not actually much in the way of really interesting features that stand out. Uh, again, this probably may well have been a seafloor in the past, but this is a mission that has got this ground-penetrating radar, which is looking down into the surface, and we're not getting the data back from that just yet. There's a lot of analysis that has to go into that. But also, Tianwen-1 is going to move to a new orbit soon, and it'll stop being able to continually service the rover. The rover has already exceeded its planned 90 days of operation, but I expect it will continue uh, heading southwards, possibly towards some distant peak or some other structure that is geologically interesting. And we'll see how far it gets. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe. Fly safe.